The names of God. We've been looking at that now for a good number of weeks. And always it's amazing to me every time I'm preparing the next message how much more there is to discover. God is a, an infinite being. He is one who has provided for us an infinite salvation. He is one whose names describe his character, his person, his works. And he is himself the one who has declared what his names are. We don't have to make them up like other religions do. God has revealed his own names in Scripture. We read the passage out of Exodus chapter 3 this morning, which dealt with the foundational name by which God has declared himself and which he says is his memorial unto all generations. And we've discovered over these many weeks as we have looked at the names of God revealed in Scripture, how frequently that name, that name Yahweh, Jehovah, as it is sometimes translated, or Lord, all capital letters, L-O-R-D, how often that name is combined with character qualities that describe who he is. Two weeks ago, last week of course, Brother Coleman was preaching, but two weeks ago as we began our study of Jehovah Tzidkenu, the Lord our righteousness, we saw that that is a name which is not only given to God in the Old Testament, but that is a name which also applies to our Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus is God according to scripture. Many religions deny that. Some will look at him as a great prophet. The various cults deny his full deity and claim that he is merely a mortal man or in some cases that he was some kind of a, an exalted angelic being. But the scripture declares that Jesus Christ is Lord. That's Jehovah. He is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And someday every knee shall bow to him. Things in heaven, things in earth, things under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God. Dear people, that's the God whom we worship. That is the heart of the gospel. If Jesus Christ is not God, he cannot give you infinite salvation. And yet if he had not come as a perfect sinless man, he could not have shed his blood and died in your place. Because the scripture teaches that without the shedding of blood, there is no remission. That is, no sending away of sin. Jesus Christ is both God and man. Permanently joined together in one person for all of eternity, that he might be not only our God, but our Redeemer. The one who paid the price for our sins. The one who gives us eternal life. And that's what brought us to our study of Jehovah Tzidkenu, the Lord, our righteousness. Jeremiah chapter 23, verse 6, In his days Judah shall be saved, and Israel shall dwell safely, and this is his name, whereby he shall be called the Lord, our righteousness. Jeremiah 23, 6. And that is the name that is applied to Christ in the New Testament. He is the one who provides salvation. He is the one who prophetically will provide for Judah and Israel, the northern tribes and the southern tribes, coming back together prophetically in the latter days to dwell in the land as we see having happened in our own time since May of 1948. And once again gathered together as a people, not yet in belief, but there will come a day, according to Paul in Romans 11:26, when all Israel shall be saved. They have a great deal of turmoil and trouble to go through first, the great tribulation period. But there is coming a day when every living Jew on the face of the earth who remains after that horrible period of time will trust Christ as his or her Savior. Before we enter that great millennial period prophesied both in the Old Testament and the New. Now last time we began to look at some of the essential practical application of this name of God. 
As we said, all true theology will result in true practice. When you truly believe something, it changes your life. The things that you believe are the things that you base your decisions on. What you really believe determines what you are next going to do. And this not merely at a point in time for salvation, but every point thereafter, what you believe about what the Word of God says will determine the way in which you act. What you believe always affects how you act. So if you have biblical theology, you will end up with a truly godly life of faith. We gave you the illustration, and I had a good, <laughs> a good example of that happen to me this past week as we were driving back from Florida. We gave you the illustration about driving a car. If you decide to turn on a road that you believe lead to your destination, but it's the wrong road, you don't get to your destination. You still end up at the wrong destination. Now, coming back home, and this was a very long trip, and some of you have heard the story, it's only about a little over 1,200 miles down to Pensacola and back again. But I ended up driving nearly 5,000 miles on this trip. It's a very long trip. Gone just one Sunday, but in between, <laughs> I did a lot of driving. And I was really tired by the time we were on our way home. And we were trying to get back a little bit early so that we could pick up Mom from Stan and Joan's house. And so we were pushing to get back, and it was very late at night. And I'm driving up Interstate 81, and I thought, yes, we have to cut across and go across Highway 50 and get over to the eastern shore of Maryland and, you know, pick her up and then get back home. And so I drove north on 81, and we had visited Michael and Vera that day, had a wonderful time with them. Beautiful view up on top of the mountains where they are in Virginia, overlooking the Shenandoah Valley. Uh, many black bears on the, the mountain right next to them. They were talking about how there was a bounty on the coyotes, and if they could shoot a coyote, they would get some money for the bounty because the farmers there and the people who raise cattle and sheep you know, want to get rid of the coyotes. And um, They'd already killed a snake at their house. And <laughs> a lot of exciting things going on, but a beautiful location. So we wound down out of the mountains and drove north on 81. And as we're driving north, getting later and later, and I'm getting tireder and tireder, and we passed Interstate 66, which cuts off to Washington, D.C., and we kept on going because I, always taking that route, go back home by way of Winston and Harper's Ferry, come over to the Beltway in Baltimore, loop around the north side toward Towson, and then head north on 95 across the Delaware Memorial Bridge. I've done this drive many, many times with all the kids in college. And so we drove up there, and just as we were approaching the Beltway, the thought suddenly struck me, Highway 50 doesn't run into Baltimore. On the other side of Baltimore is the Francis Scott Key Bridge. 50 runs out of Washington. I had driven all the way north. The distance from Washington to Baltimore had gotten over to the loop around Baltimore before it suddenly struck me I was on the wrong road. You know, that realization did not put me on the right road. It meant that we had to do some extra driving. As a matter of fact, right as we got there, and it's a good thing this happened, because otherwise I probably wouldn't have caught it until I had already gotten north on 95. There was a humongous car wreck, and the traffic was backed way up, and all the lanes funneled down to one lane, and as we finally got up there so that I could go south instead of north, there was a minivan with its back up, end up on the rails, the whole side mashed in, two or three other cars. Apparently somebody had been trying to cross lanes where they shouldn't, and police cars every which way, and so we started going south. Praise the Lord, I have a bunch of relatives on my wife's side of the family that live in that area. They were able to uh, get us on a crossroad over to 97 and down to 50 and finally across the Annapolis Bay Bridge. And very late at night, we finally arrived. People, it's like that in life. You make the wrong decisions, and it can end you in the wrong destination. 
and how important it is to make the right decisions in your spiritual life because you may end up in hell if you do not make the initial right decision. And then decisions after that which will lead to a productive, fruitful, happy Christian life. Oh, you won't lose your salvation, but you can certainly go a long way astray. What you really believe does make a difference. And the first decision you have to make concerns how to get to heaven. Are you going to trust your good works? Are you going to trust the money that you've thrown into some church offering basket somewhere? Or are you going to trust the only way that God has provided? Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Now, either he's telling us the truth, or he's lying, or he's nuts. You've got to make that decision. But if you trust Jesus Christ, he guarantees eternal life. Then you have to begin to look at the practical life decisions that you're making. Are you living life according to God's terms? Are you making decisions based on what the Word of God reveals should be manifest in the life of a Christian? When others see you, when others hear you, when others perceive your motives, when others interact with you, do they see Christ in you, the hope of glory? Or do they see the flesh? Do they see the world and all of its premises? I hope they don't see in you the devil and demonic activity working in your life. We said a few moments ago, Jesus will take you as you are, but Jesus never leaves you as you are. He changes lives. And that relates to our topic this morning on the name of God, the Lord, our righteousness. You see, the scripture tells us that we are being conformed by the Spirit of God and through the study of the Word of God, we are being conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. So that when people see us, they should see him. So that when people hear us, they should hear him. When people perceive our motives, they should see motives that glorify Christ. Christ in you, the hope of glory, the scripture declares. Imputed righteousness, which is the righteousness of Christ, transferred to our bank account spiritually, does make a difference. And Paul explains that in Romans chapter 6, Neither yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. That's the obligation of the Christian. That is something that you do every day of your life. We've talked about that in some detail in the past, so I'll not belabor it here. But if you are alive from the dead, yield your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. That means your hands, your ears, your eyes, your feet. Every part of your body, that which is visible, that which is covered, belongs to God. And so yield it. Instead of yielding it to sin, yield it to God. As those who are alive, you're no longer dead in trespasses and sins. You have been made alive by the Spirit of God through faith in Christ. So now yield so that he may control everything about you and what you do, what you think, what you say, how you live, what you put into your body, what goes out from your body, what your body has contact with. Yield the members of your body as instruments of righteousness. You see, the Lord, our righteousness, is the name of Christ. And if you would live for Christ, you must manifest through your body, which is the only visible way people can tell, you must manifest Christ. What would he do? How would he respond in this situation? What would be his motivation in saying this thing? 
When we begin to think like that, it does change the way in which we live. But you know, and here's something we did not talk about before, but we must talk about here. You say, well, I'd like to do that, but I'm having a real struggle doing that. Well, perhaps you have failed to do one thing first that must precede the daily yielding of your members to Christ. Paul explains it in Romans chapter 12. This continuous day-by-day -day decision of Romans 6 must be preceded by a once-and-for-all decision. A once-and-for-all presentation. It's in the aorist tense, which is a punctiliar aorist. It means uh, something that you do at one point in time which has continuing results. Now, you did that at salvation. You trusted Christ. That changed your eternal destiny. That was a point-in-time decision which has implications and effect for all of eternity. But did you know living the Christian life also has a punctiliar, point-in-time decision that you must make if you would truly have a life that can please God? And that's what Paul explains in Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God. Now listen to it. Here it is. That ye present your bodies a living sacrifice. It's a punctiliar aorist. That means a point in time, you do this at one point in time. It is a commitment that is made that has continuing results. You want the results that will take place in your body. You present your bodies a living sacrifice. And then you're yielding the members of your bodies, back in Romans chapter 6, so that they will be members of righteousness. Let me go on here in Romans 12. That you present your bodies a living sacrifice, not a dead sacrifice. Christ died for our sins. He made a sacrifice. In our place, as the Lamb of God, behold the Lamb of God, John 1, which taketh away the sin of the world. He's made that sacrifice. Now he asks you to make a sacrifice. Present your body. Oh, that's the tough one. That's where the flesh is. That's where the struggle goes on. Present your bodies, a living sacrifice. What kind of a sacrifice is it to be? It tells you in the next few verses, the uh, next few words. Holy it's to be a holy sacrifice. It's not only a living sacrifice, it is to be a holy sacrifice. He tells you something else about that sacrifice. It is to be acceptable unto God. If you present a sacrifice that is not acceptable to God, it is a worthless sacrifice. Think back all the way to the opening chapters of the book of Genesis. We have Adam and Eve sinning we have God clothing them with skins after they tried to cover themselves with vegetation. That should have taught some lessons for down the road, but a couple of boys didn't remember that. God clothed them with skins, which meant an animal had to be killed to cover them and their nakedness. The fig leaves were no good. And then we come to a point where Cain is a tiller of the field. He raises crops, vegetables, and so on. And Abel is a shepherd. And so on one occasion, they bring their offerings to the Lord. One was accepted, the bleeding offering of the lamb that Abel brought. But it tells us the Lord did not have respect under the offering that Cain brought because he brought of the tillage of the ground. And Cain was mad about it. Cain was furious that God rejected his offering because, you see, God had already declared that the type of offering that was necessary was the bleeding sacrifice because that portrayed the coming Messiah. That portrayed Christ. Vegetables don't portray Christ.
It was an unacceptable offering. So the third thing we're told about this presentation of our bodies as a living sacrifice, it is an offering that is acceptable to God. When you try to bring anything else but what God has required, it is an unacceptable offering. And then he tells us in the last phrase of verse 1, which is your reasonable service. Did you know God never asks you to do anything that is unreasonable? Now, many times we think it's unreasonable because we have the wrong perspective because we have the human perspective, because we think like the world instead of thinking like Christ. Our minds need to be changed. And that's what Paul explains in verse 2. Be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of of God. An acceptable sacrifice that conforms to the acceptable and perfect will of God. Friends, have you ever done that? I think most of you here have at some point in time, and you can probably identify it. At some point in time, you made a personal decision to trust Christ. Now we know that election is true, we know predestination is true and all that, but in terms of the life that you live on this earth, you are making decisions. Yes, they may have been foreordained before the foundation of the world, but you are going through a process here below. The question is, what are you doing? Can you point back to a point in time where you trusted Christ alone to save you. Think for a moment. I can remember all the way back to when I was three years old because it changed me at three. When I came to my mother and told her my dad had been preaching about hell and told her, I don't want to go to hell. I want to, I want to trust Jesus and be saved. I was three years old. I've got grandsons now that are three years old. And yes, they can understand the gospel. They sure can. And I knelt down as she sat on the bed. And I gave my heart to Jesus. I trusted Christ alone to save me from my sins. You say, what sins can a little three-year-old do? Even one sin will send you to hell, friend. And you know, it changed my life. And as I got a little bit older, I came across Romans chapter 12 and realized I need to do that. I need to present my body as a living sacrifice. It's not going to be my will. It'll be God's will for my life. What does God want me to do? And through all the things that little boys think about as they're growing up and want to be a fireman or a detective, and I used to want to be a detective like the Hardy Boys, <laughs> all those things, God kept me focused on something. He called me to preach. And he opened all the doors, and he provided all the cash, and he brought me through. And he's given me more than 40 years of ministry. Because at one point I said, no longer my will, but thy will. At one point I made it clear that I wanted to do Romans chapter 12. Present my body a living sacrifice. I could have made a lot more money as a lawyer, which I also am. I could have made a lot more money. I could have done a lot more fun things. but I presented my body as a living sacrifice. A holy sacrifice, it meant I had to live for Christ. A sacrifice that God said was acceptable 
and a sacrifice which is reasonable in light of what Christ did for me. That is not unreasonable that he expects us to live for him when Christ died for us. That's not an unreasonable request. Dear friends, some of you are older, some are quite young. Have you ever done that? You've trusted Christ, you're saved. Now, have you presented your body a living sacrifice unto God? A holy sacrifice. An acceptable sacrifice. A sacrifice that results in reasonable service. Or are you still being conformed to this world? Or has the Spirit of God began to work in your mind so that you have a transformation of your mind so that you can prove, that is, externally, visibly, show to others what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God? You know, those two verses, that's what introduces Paul's discussion of the spiritual gifts in verses 3 and following. If you would have a correct use of the spiritual gifts that God has given to you, you must make that presentation of your body as a living sacrifice. He goes on in verse 3, For I say through the grace given unto me to every man that is among you not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly according as God hath dealt to every man the measure of faith. For as we have many members in one body, remember we've just been talking about presenting our bodies as a living sacrifice. Now he says, just like your body has many members in it, and all the members have not the same office, your hand doesn't do the same thing that your nose does, so we, being many, are one body in Christ, and every one members one of another. That means we're joined together. Earlier in the prayer, we were praying for our Nigerian brothers and sisters who are undergoing severe persecution, some of them being killed, some being tortured, some being imprisoned, some being driven from their homes, having their homes and churches burned to the ground, fleeing and hiding out in the jungles. Did you know that when they suffer, we suffer? Paul tells us that here. We are members one of another. Having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, whether prophecy, let us prophesy according to the proportion of faith, or ministry, let us wait on our ministering, or he that teacheth on teaching, or he that exhorteth on exhortation, he that giveth, let him do it with simplicity, diplotes, without folds, nothing hidden, it's no ulterior motives in giving. We talked about that when we went through the spiritual gifts. He that ruleth with diligence, he that showeth mercy with cheerfulness, let love be without dissimulation. Notice, don't fake it. Abhor that which is evil, cleave to that which is good. Transformed life, isn't it? You see, when you present your body a living sacrifice, it changes the way you live. Not slothful in business, Fervent in spirit, serving the Lord, rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation. These are all changes that happen when you present your body a living sacrifice and when you live that way, according to Romans 6. Patient in tribulation, continuing instant in prayer, distributing to necessity of saints, given to hospitality, bless them which persecute you, bless and curse not. Rejoice with them that do rejoice and weep with them that weep. Be of the same mind one toward another. Mind not high things, but condescend to men of low estate. Be not wise in your own conceits. Recompense to no man evil for evil. Provide for things honest in the sight of all men, if it be possible. As much as lieth in you, and sometimes this is a tough one, live peaceably with all men. Dearly beloved, venge not yourselves. But rather, give place unto wrath, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. Therefore, if thine enemy hunger, feed him. 
If he thirst, give him drink. For in so doing, thou shalt heap coals of fire on his head. Be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. When you present your body a living sacrifice, it changes your life. That's what Romans 12 is all about. Do you ever wonder why God is not using you as fully as he could? Does it ever bother your conscience that perhaps you've not been committed to him as you ought to be? Are you just a surface Christian who tips his or her hat to God for one hour a week on Sunday morning but have no commitment for service the rest of the week? Have you ever, listen carefully, have you ever really sacrificed anything for Christ? I'm not talking about merely giving him part of your surplus resources, giving him part of your surplus time, part of your surplus energy, part of your surplus money, or part of your surplus interests. Pause for a moment. Ask yourself this question. This is not rhetorical. I would like you to ask yourself this question. What have I ever sacrificed for Christ? What have I ever sacrificed for Christ? I'll pause for a minute while you think about that. Don't just wait for me to say my next sentence. Ask yourself the question. What have I ever sacrificed? We're talking about that which is inconvenient, that which is costly, like the woman with the box, the alabaster box of ointment, which was worth an entire year's wage. What have I personally ever sacrificed for Christ? Okay, let me ask you the next question. Did anything at all come to your mind? Did anything at all come to your mind? Did you even ask the question or did you harden your heart? How long has it been since you sacrificed anything for Christ? You see the bottom line in all of this, because it goes back to our name for God, the Lord, our righteousness. The bottom line in all of this goes back to Romans 12 and Romans 6. Have you made the once and for all decision to present your body as a living sacrifice to God? You know, it's like the once and for all commitment that you make when you get married. If not, the daily practice of yielding to righteousness will be difficult because you've made no commitment. Just like the daily yielding of rights to a boyfriend or girlfriend won't last because there's no permanent commitment there with the boyfriend or the girlfriend. If you haven't made the once and for all commitment of Romans chapter 12, the practice of Romans 6 will be very, very hard. And you will not be serving Christ with your gifts as you should be. Just as some people like the benefits of marriage without the obligations and the responsibilities of marriage until so they shack up. Even so, some Christians like the benefits of being saved without ever really making the commitments of the Christian life. These two principles, that is the once and for all commitment of your body, and the daily yielding of the members of your body to righteousness, when those two principles are joined together, it leads to a fruitful life of service with our spiritual gifts, and secondly, it leads to a godly, separated Christian life. Several weeks ago, we gave you the verse out of 2 Corinthians chapter 6.14, Be ye not 
unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? You see, you've been made righteous in Christ. You're to be living a righteous life. What fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? What communion hath light with darkness? I can see our time is up. Oh, I wanted to give you another illustration, but we'll have to wait for that next week. Let's close in prayer. Our gracious Heavenly Father, how we thank you for your word. You've called us to a life of holy service, a life whereby everything belongs to you. Nothing belongs to us. Christ bought us lock, stock, and barrel, body, soul, and spirit. He paid the price on Calvary. We belong to him. He is the Lord, our righteousness. How has that changed our lives? All true theology, rightly believed, will lead to godly living. We make decisions on a daily basis. Most of us here have made a decision at one point to trust Christ alone. He saved us. He promised to do it. He did it. The question of eternity has been settled. But perhaps some of us here have never made that second decision, which is to present our bodies, our bodies, as a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is our reasonable service so that we can then move on and not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of our mind that we may prove openly manifest what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God, which is a life that pleases Christ, a life that manifests the gifts, a life that shows forth the fruit of the Spirit, a life that is a separated life, a life that brings glory to God, and doesn't wallow in the flesh. Father, in the quietness of this moment, I pray that if there is anyone here, a boy or a girl, a young adult, a man or a woman, an old person, who has never truly presented his or her body as a living sacrifice, or doesn't know if they've done it, isn't quite sure. Can't look back to a point where they said, I know I did this, and now, day by day, I want to yield my members as members of righteousness to the service of Christ. Father, if there's someone like that, I pray that right now, in the quietness of this moment, you will cause that person to say, Lord, I'm saved, I know I'm saved. I'm on the road to heaven. But I know I'm walking down this road a lot of times in the flesh. And I'm not very pleasing to you. And I'm not very committed to you. If it's not convenient, I don't do it. If it requires sacrifice, I don't do it. If it requires open witness, I don't do it. If it requires a yielded life, I don't do it. If it requires running over my carnal desires, I don't do it. And so now, Father, I want to present my body as a living sacrifice. Oh, that sacrifice will keep trying to crawl off the altar because it's alive. But, Father, keep it there. I present my body a living sacrifice, a holy sacrifice an acceptable unto God sacrifice. And it's reasonable to be called to this service because of what Christ did for me. I make that commitment now. I make that presentation now. Take my life, Father. Use it in the way that you want it to be used. Not the way I want it to be used not the way that pleases me, but the way that pleases you. Because I truly believe that your plan is best, your will is best, 
that acceptable, perfect will of God is what I want in my life, and I want it to show so that I can prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Oh, Father, transform me. Renew my mind. By the Spirit of God and by the Word of God, change me into the image of Jesus Christ, that others might see him living in me. And then, Father, help me day by day to present my members and to yield those to Christ and to his service. Give me the strength that you've promised to give, for we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Our closing hymn for this morning is hymn number 344, a great hymn to follow that message, number